2.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, living on the edge. Thousands live a few kilometers from the Philippines' most active volcano, despite the dangers, and climbing tragic trails. Nepal's mountaineering guides hope for better times after tragedies that killed some of their own. I'm Wang Mengmang, and this is Assignment Asia. Life is full of risks. And for thousands of residents in the Philippine province, it's right in their own backyard. A perfectly shaped volcano, famous for its beauty, but also for being the country's deadliest. Steve Lund traveled to a community near Magan Volcano in the Philippines to understand why residents insist on staying despite being near what seems to be a ticking time bomb. Edwin and his family enjoy life on their farm. With its tropical climate, free-flowing spring water and rich soil, this seems like farming heaven. But only if you can forget for a moment that beyond this ridge is the Philippines' most active volcano, Mount Mayon. Although this area is classified by authorities as a permanent danger zone, Edwin and his family continue to live here. Sometimes some people say, the Mayon is danger zone, but for us, Mayon is uh, resources. It's part of our life. The farm is very fertile. The land is very good to crops and animals. Smoldering and sizzling on the Pacific Ring of Fire, the Philippines has 24 active volcanoes. And this is the most active and most lethal of them all. Rising two and a half kilometers into the sky, Mount Mayon is widely regarded as the world's most perfectly shaped volcano. Mayon's name comes from the legend of a beautiful princess whose romance was thwarted, so she's prone to bouts of anger. Thousands of Mayon's subjects live in Bunga, just six kilometers away from her volcanic majesty. They must all watch their ruler very closely, on alert for any signs of displeasure that might lead to deadly tantrums. Since records began in the 17th century, Mayon has erupted no less than 50 times. As a residence in six kilometers danger zone in Port of Mayon, since birth, I am already here. I've been in farming for 20 years. My mother, my grandmother are farmers. Would you move to farm somewhere else if you had a choice, somewhere safer? If the farm, or the lupa, is the same as we are here Mayon, pwede siguro kung papaalisin kami rito na mayroon din kaming pagtataniman na magandang lupa saka yung continuous supply ng tubig, ah, siguro pwede kaming mag-evacuate permanente kung paaalisin ng government pero kung sa ngayon, kung wala namang mapaglilipatan na ganitong klase ng mga lupa na napakaganda mahirapan siguro kami naman I'm standing just on the boundary of the permanent danger zone six kilometers away from Mount Mayon the volcano looks more alluring than lethal in this peaceful evening light. But scientists here say Mayon's current condition is actually abnormal, so they've raised a level one alert. But even without any such official alert, experts warn of Mayon's perennial life-threatening dangers, such as avalanches, sudden ash explosions and steam-driven eruptions. For 20 years now, this scientist has been watching Mayon more closely than anyone. We monitor Mayan Volcano closely because there are a lot of people living at the base or around Mayan Volcano. And uh, the people would be at, in danger if there would be a sudden phreatic eruptions. Mayan's behavior is also examined by the government scientists in Manila. A steam-driven eruption is really a problem. And that is why we have the permanent danger zone, actually. Mayan is known for having very explosive eruptions that can propel very dangerous volcanic hazards called pyroclastic flows very far down the volcanic slopes. That the six kilometers is at least a minimum distance for safety. Pyroclastic flows is the one that killed people along the way. It might be beyond 300 degrees Celsius or higher. And how fast is it moving? It can go as fast as 60 to 100 kilometers per hour. There used to be a town here called Kagsawa, about 10 kilometers away from Mayon. 
that on the 1st of February 1814, its entire population was buried following the volcano's most lethal eruption to date. Hot rocks, gas, ash and water hurtled down Mayan steep slopes like a heated wall of wet concrete. More than 1,200 people were killed and this church is the only building that was not completely buried. Olivia enjoys living in Bunga, except when Mayan explodes. Of the many eruptions she's seen, 1984 was the most frightening. Grabe to ang ano nangyari diyan kang mayon pataas parang nag-ikot-ikot so uh, lava takbuhan ba ang mga tao doon kami o oh, na wala nang anuan niya nang ano takbo ng gamit iwan ang gamit basta tao lang ang tumatakbo tapos sa tapos pa doon sa ano evacuation araw kasi kung gabi yun maraming yun na Growing crops is easier in Mayan soil. It's so rich and fertile. They also get plenty of rain. As government-owned land, it's also free to plant here. But this is a very risky bargain indeed, and many farmers have paid the highest price of all for the fruits of their labor. In 1993, a completely unexpected eruption killed 77 farmers. So while these guys might be volcano-wise, no one can predict Mayon's volatility. Now the leader of Bunga's community, 37-year-old Michael, was just a lad when he first saw the might of Mayon. I was scared in 1993. It was the of the Mayon volcano. I afraid because I think the people of Bunga is not prepared to what to do during the big eruption. In 2013, yet another eruption killed four European mountaineers and their Filipino guide. The climbers were clients of Martin Kaleya, owner of an adventure tourism business, and the guide was his employee. They knew that it was, it was risky climbing, but they never knew that it can happen any time, any moment. Kenneth was also one of Martin's guides in that disastrous expedition. Hit by hot rocks and badly burned on his back and leg, Kenneth was lucky to survive. So very fag. Nag-decide rin yung kaibigan namin na may fellow guide na huwag nalang ituloy pa sa amin kasi so very fag. Tapos yun, pagbaba namin, may narinig ako na ano, na boulder Ah, uh, trembling stone, ganyan. May masyadong malakas kaso hindi namin makita kung saan galing. Authorities say it's difficult to prevent people from entering the permanent danger zone. And even when scientists forecast an eruption, it's hard convincing residents to leave. In 2014, volcanologists predicted a dangerous eruption. The provincial government tried to evacuate everyone from the permanent danger zone, including the people of Bunga, but they refused to leave. Maybe magnanakaw ng mga halaman, yung crops, mga yung baboy, yung mga manok, at saka yung mga, pag umalis kami rito, baka mamaya mawala. They hide inside their houses, they close their houses, they close their windows, then they don't, even the... Uh, armies, uh, the armies and the police are calling for for evacuation. They don't make a sound, so to them, uh, no one is in the house. Predicting eruptions is hardly an exact science. If you look at the activities of Mayan volcano, sometimes one year, sometimes three years, six years have no definite interval. So as long as there would be pressure beneath Mayan, it would erupt. Behavior differs for every volcano, for every eruption in Mayon and we have to have all sorts of data to look at and we have to make our best uh, inferences as to what the volcano is going to do next. So this is quite a challenge for, for Mayon. Prediction of steam driven eruption is one of the frontiers and until now we are not able to predict this. As the eruption predicted by experts in 2014 did not in fact happen, people lost confidence in the scientists their projection na magkakaroon ng explosion. So maraming nag-alisan hanggang naghintay ng matagal na disturb karamihan yung livelihood nila. Iniwanan yung mga tanim dahil magpuputok raw. Wala namang nangyari. 
Siyempre, maraming tao na nagsasabi na hindi naman nangyari. O, di, parang kumunti yung trust. Nabawasan ng konti siguro. Yung trust namin sa Facebook. Kahihintay, kahihintay. Hanggang wala namang dumating na talagang big explosion. Eh, masakit. Nung hindi sila nagbigay ng warning, mayroong pumutok yung manon. Mayo, nandun pala yung ibang mga foreigner, di ba, may namatay. So, yun ang masakit. Hindi nila yun na, na project. But anyway, hit in me siguro naman yun. Uh, dahil nature siya eh, walang nakakaalam. Yes, that's the most difficult part. When we are being questioned at every, at every, uh, on every step of the way, we're being questioned as to our interpretation and our methodologies and the advice that we give and we are being, cha being challenged. Distrusting scientific projections, many residents prefer to rely on their own ways of predicting an eruption. They are waiting for signs like shaking of the grounds and snakes coming down from the summit. Another one is this, the presence of this hermit. They say that it only appears during eruption. So even if PBOX says they have to evacuate, but if the signs are not really evident, then you will find it hard to make these people leave Balangaybo. Without any obvious signs of eruption, life inside the permanent danger zone goes on. And many tourists are also drawn to this place of peril. This could be the quickest way to explore a highly active volcano without lingering too long. This is fast and fun, as long as your wheels keep turning. The adventure tourism business here has continued to flourish despite those five deaths caused by Mayon's eruption in 2013. Very erratic, volatile situation of Mount Mayon gives it the premium for adventurers. They seek for it. We had a lot of calls coming from adventurers wanting to climb Mount Mayon again just to, you know, get the, the thrill that any time they can they can die in that in that adventure, yeah. Maybe that's part of the rush. That life is so fragile, yeah? and yet you you're tempting on it. And once you survive, you say, yeah, you cheated death. <laughs> Mayon's ever-changing moods may often be monstrous, yet she also has a generous soul, providing ideal farming conditions. We continue farming. We continue growing crops because the, this area, the soil. The atmosphere, the environment is very conducive for farming. And the busy volcano also bestows bounties perfect for construction. High quality sand coming from my volcano. Gravel also coming from my volcano, first class. But Mayon's appeal isn't just economic. People living here enjoy Mayon's thrilling beauty. They also feel protected by their faith and reassured by a special community spirit. Naiiling yan na banggi may nagtutukad yan sa mayon volcano may ilaw. Si mahal na ina daw yan, ta nagmimilagro para isalbad a kaming bunga. Hindi mo man makalimutan dito sa bunga ang ano, uh, mga tao, mamabait mang kisa. Kahit anong pakisama mo, siyempre may nila yun eh, iba-ibang tao. Basically, their livelihood is here and they grew up from this place and who wants to be taken away from things that you love most. Scientists and officials may urge everyone to leave the permanent danger zone, but perhaps following deeper instincts, these resilient residents prefer to believe they found their permanent comfort zone. For Assignment Asia, this is Steve Lunt in Albay Province, the Philippines. Mayan has been stable and quiet since 2014, but it remains an active volcano that experts say can erupt any time. Still, farming and tourism continue to strive near it. Up next on Assignment Asia. The risks that Nepal's mountaineering guys face in their line of work. Nepal's economy relies heavily on tourism. It's a huge industry fueled mainly by people climbing the world's highest peak, Chomalangma, also known as Everest. But disasters in recent years claimed the lives of a number of Sherpa mountaineering guys and porters, the tourism industry's backbone. As Pearlie Jacob reports from Nepal, the tragedies also brought to the fore the risks that Sherpas face. <laughs> Thank you. 
signs of destruction are still everywhere in the Mount Everest region of Nepal's Khumbu Valley, six months after the big quake. 19 people lost their lives at the base camp of Mount Chomolangma, known to the Western world as Everest, when the April 2015 earthquake triggered an avalanche. After a devastating spring season, locals are relieved to see tourists slowly coming back to the Khumbu Valley. And trekking guides like Dawatashi Sherpa are back to work. Dawatashi had worked as a high-altitude climbing guide and porter on mountaineering expeditions, but his last trip almost cost him his life. On the morning of April 18, 2014, a year before the earthquake, Dawatashi was ferrying loads across the upper section of the Khumbu Glacier, an area notorious for falling ice and littered with deep crevasses. Suddenly, Disaster struck. On the way, there's uh, lots, lots of traffic jam, and we waited a few minutes. At the same time, the avalanche hit. We are that uh, 13 people all together, but nowadays I'm only alive. Being very sad, you know. I lost my 12 friend in the same place. One of the few survivors struck by the avalanche, Dawatashi broke four ribs, his shoulder, and nose. And this one is of 2008 with Appa Sherpa, yeah. His fellow expedition worker, Ankaji Sherpa, died, leaving his then 18-year-old daughter, Chechi, to take care of five younger siblings. And he was always in love with uh, mountains. And since he was engaged in this uh, sector of, uh, since from 15 years, and, uh, and he, can, he was uh, ready to do everything for the mountaineering. Today, pictures are all that's left as reminders of the family's sole breadwinner, a beloved father, an accomplished mountaineer. With no motor roads, Transporting loads for tourists and remote mountain communities is the main source of income for many people in the Mount Everest region. The higher porters go, the more they get paid, and expedition jobs that require technical skills to climb icy slopes and cross deep crevasses are not for everyone. For generations, Ethnic Sherpas who live in the eastern Himalayan region have been assisting mountaineering expeditions. Up to 90% of high-altitude workers are Sherpas, a fact that has made Sherpa a household name. Like many of his climbing friends, Dawatashi Sherpa started working at a young age out of necessity. I stopped my study when I was 12 years old, and then I started to work as a porter in the mountain. My parents are a farmer. It's a bit difficult to run my education. And I, I saw they are facing very difficult, and uh, I left my study. After a few years as a porter, Dawa wanted to be a high altitude worker, lured not only by the promise of better pay. I want to become an international mountain guide. We have to climb 8,000 meters straight. It's a, not a, a small thing to get on top of the world. In April 2013, Dawatashi summited Mount Everest for the first time, a step towards securing his future in the climbing industry. If you climb Everest, you're obviously you know, most likely to get employed uh, again and again, especially on a smaller peak. There's always going to be people who want to go, and that's definitely yes, because uh, uh, it's the highest and it pays highest. So the, there's like double drive, you know. Despite the dangers, the money keeps people coming back to expedition jobs. Top workers can expect to earn up to 6,000 US dollars working two seasons a year, a huge amount in this impoverished country where average annual salaries are about 600 US dollars. 
For decades, ethnic Sherpas have literally served as a backbone for Nepal's expedition service industry that brings in millions of dollars in annual revenues to the country. And while the hard work of expedition workers have helped improve life for their families, for many, this has also come at an irreparable cost. Aside from natural disasters, Sherpas face health risks because they breathe limited amounts of oxygen for long periods while at work. In 2012, Che Wang Zhangmu's husband, Dawa Tenzing, suffered a stroke at 6,200 meters above sea level while on an expedition. He was airlifted to a hospital in Kathmandu, but soon died. Despite her loss, Che Wang Zhangmu leaves little room for emotion and remains practical about the job that cost her husband his life. <laughs> 66-year-old Lapa Galjian was working with a Chinese expedition on the north face of Everest in 2000 when he suffered a stroke above 8,000 meters. <laughs> The stroke left him partially paralyzed and permanently disabled. Unable to cope, his wife left him. Lakpa had no insurance cover and gets by with help from his neighbors, who are also helping to rebuild his earthquake-damaged house. With barely any other sources of income, many here see expeditions as a necessity. Kanchanuru Sherpa summited Mount Everest five times. When not on expeditions, he spends time taking care of his yaks. But now, he's looking forward to the next climbing season. According to the Himalayan database, 174 local expedition workers have died while working in the mountains in Nepal between 1993 and 2013 alone. 72 of those deaths were on Mount Everest. Till date, 113 Nepalese workers have died on Mount Everest since expeditions first began. The ever-present risk of something going wrong on the mountains makes many families beg their relatives in the expedition business to find other jobs. In Kathmandu, seven-time Everest summiteer, Ang Nyamgel Sherpa is now assembling watches for an American luxury brand. A job offered to him by the owner of the company who had summited Mount Everest with Nyamgal as his guide. I miss climbing but I'm retired now because uh, my family, they don't want me to climb again. Although he's moved on, Nyamgal believes the work of climbing Sherpas should continue. Tourism is uh, the most important for Nepal, you know. The Sherpas had been climbing from uh, 1953, you know. So I think the Sherpas has to climb the Everest or climb other mountains. Because of the risks that come with climbing, residents here believe expedition workers need to have more support and better insurance cover. After the 2014 Everest avalanche, Nepal's government offered $400 each to the victims' families. The tiny compensation angered expedition workers. They went on a strike, forcing the government to accept demands to increase life insurance cover to a sum of $15,000. Medical insurance cover was also hiked to about $5,000 and for the first time, insurance cover was made mandatory for all expeditions on all peaks. Industry insiders say more has to be done beyond just giving climbing Sherpas better insurance. To make mountains safer, obviously somebody has to go and train people. The money has to be spent there. We especially saying better pay for the high altitude like the workers, especially Everest, because we know it's a big industry and uh, they are taking a lot of risks because they're going there more often than any other mountains. So they're doing the trips through the ice pole more. One other thing is like there, there's certain things the government could do better 
to regulate mountains better. Since the two disasters, Nepal has also announced new regulations to limit the number of climbers allowed on Mount Everest, preventing those with physical disabilities and without prior experience from climbing. But some tourists, like British climber Roger Owen, don't fully agree. I don't think there necessarily needs to be a restriction on numbers. I think one of the restrictions needs to be around the skill and the um, experience people have had previous to climbing Everest. I mean, we were watching people on the final buttress that's at nearly 29,000 feet called the Hillary Step. We were watching them being taught to climb it. It's difficult at 29,000 feet. It's a simple piece of rock at sea level. But these were people being taught the basics of rock climbing and they were holding everybody else up, which puts everybody in danger. For many families of expedition workers killed on the job, it's a struggle to get government help. At first it was uh, very difficult to handle. Yeah, obviously trekking agency and other foreign agencies, they are helping us more in, in comparison to the government. Meanwhile at home, Dawatashi is grateful for his second chance at life and the opportunity to witness the birth of his son born just a few months after his accident. The little family is grateful for the time they have to spend together. But there is the future to consider. But nowadays, yeah, my family all says uh, go abroad, uh, find some job in foreign countries and work there. To get a visa, to go there, it's very difficult for us. So that's why uh, most of the people are working in mountains. Even after that much accident, I'm injured with mountain too. Being a mountaineer, yeah. After two years of tragedy, Nepal's mountaineering community is hoping for better times. Yeah, so hopefully uh, this is it for the, the bad luck. We will be going again on south side in 2016. Yeah, trying to do everything as normal and not to uh, get uh, too s sentimental about what happened in the past and get bogged down by that. Just trying to do everything as usual and trying to do it even better. Yeah. The last two years have been some of the most difficult for Nepal's mountaineering community. The hope now is that lessons learned from the last disasters will help secure a better future for expedition workers and their loved ones. For Assignment Asia, this is Pearlie Jacob in Nepal. After the April 2015 earthquake and Nepal's decision to stop expeditions to Everest, nobody reached its summit for an entire year for the first time in four decades. You can learn more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Wang Mengmang. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.